Hello, my name is Martin. It was a sunny day in June. Me and my friends were visiting a local park where there was a very big house and a beautiful garden. The house was open up for visitors to look around and there was a shop and even a restaurant. I am a huge fan of mazes, but was never in one in real life. I just did them in books and comics or wherever I came across one. The main reason I wanted to visit this park house was because I knew there was a maze there. When me and my friends arrived at the maze, I was so excited, but I felt that excitement drain away when my friends said they weren't going in because they heard a story that one time a boy or age went in there and was never seen again. I told them that it was just a silly urban legend that wasn't true, but they were adamant they weren't going in. I could see the fear in their eyes, and I couldn't understand why. I told them, okay, if you want to spoil the party, that's okay, but I'm going in and enjoying the maze. Besides, if anyone was going missing in there, don't you think we would have heard of a lot more people going missing? I walked in and was amazed at how high the ditches were. I could feel the excitement overcome me. I felt that my friends were missing out so much, but suddenly after a half an hour walking around there, I felt for the first time a pang of fear, and a few minutes after that, I wish I hadn't gone in. I shouted out loud to my friends, but all I could hear was the echo of my voice fill the air. I suddenly got the weirdest feeling someone was watching me. I panicked thinking it was the boy who vanished, who my friends were telling me about. I walked around and around and around, I had enough of the maze now, I wanted to get to the exit to get out of it. Suddenly I heard some shouting, and to my relief I realized it was my friend Sarah. When I got out of the maze, I acted like I wasn't afraid and said, that maze is so cool, I was walking around for hours it seemed like, and I genuinely couldn't find my way out. They must have designed this maze so well. That night I was in my room, but that was when the weirdest thing had happened. I walked out of my room, and when I walked into, which should have been my hall, I was in my room again. I suddenly saw a door in another direction, and once again when I entered it, I was in my room. This kept happening over and over and over. I could not make any sense of it, because I could look back and see my room, and turn around and look in the door and see my room again. I was panicking, thinking of the maze, knowing what was happening to me in there is happening to me right now in my own bedroom. Suddenly I fell over something when I was going through the door. It was a book. I picked it up and the title read The Maze. I opened it up and read the first page and a shiver ran up my spine. The publishing date was 2020 and the year at the time was 2010. I looked at the writer's name, and it was my best friend Sarah. Then I read, Ten years ago, my friend entered a maze that me and my friend warned him about, and he never was seen again. We had warned him of exactly the same thing happening another boy, years ago, who we cannot find out who it is. I stopped reading, then jumped when I heard a voice behind me. I turned around. My dad was staring right in front of me and said, Son, don't be afraid. That maze gave you a secret magic that will make up for any friends you may never have seen again. You will understand as time goes on. I know, trust me, I was that other boy that went missing.
Susie was walking down the road one night in the countryside when she was surprised by hearing a phone box ring. She wondered who would be calling a public phone box, especially in the middle of nowhere. Well, it was near a bus stop, but besides that, no one was around, unless they were waiting for the bus, of course. She had decided to answer the phone when she was surprised to hear a man's voice. Hello, is anyone there? Susie said. Hello, yes, I'm here. I'm sure you must have the wrong number. This is a public phone box. The man spoke again. Oh, maybe I did call the wrong number. But thank you very much for answering and letting me know. I must say, you have a very nice voice. I am very sorry if I put you out of your way, but it was very nice to speak to you anyway. I guess you must be wondering why I'm calling a public phone box. Well, it was very nice to speak to you. I hope you're having a good night. Susie felt strange, a stranger calling a phone box, asking her was she having a good night. But she liked how he spoke, so replied. Yes, I'm having a great night, thanks for asking. I'm just waiting for the bus to go home now. The man said, Oh, I'm very glad to hear you're having a good night. So the public phone box is near a bus stop, then I gather. Susie was enjoying the chat with the man, but realised the bus was coming, so quickly said, I'm very sorry, I have to go. The bus is coming. It was nice talking to you. Bye. The man said, it was very splendid talking to you also. Bye now. Susie walked into the bus and felt happy for some strange reason. About the phone call, the man had left a good impression on her. She was wondering was it his voice or what he said and she wondered what he had looked like. When she got home, she told her sister Rachel all about it. I was waiting for the 10 o'clock bus. And well, I was very surprised to hear the public phone ring in the phone box right next to the bus stop. I answered it, and there was this really sweet man on the other end. And well, we had a lovely chat, but unfortunately the bus came before I could even tell him my name. Her sister smiled and said, Wow, what age was he? I wonder what he looked like. Maybe he looked like a film star. Susie said, I'm not sure what age he was, and of course I have no idea what he looked like, but he seemed so sweet. Rachel said, Are you going to wait at the bus stop again tomorrow night to see if he calls? How do you expect him to call the same phone box again at the same time? It obviously was a wrong number he dialed. But the next night Susie made sure to be waiting for the 10 o'clock bus again and was pleasantly surprised when the phone rang again. She ran into it and answered. Hello? Hello Susie. I am very happy that you were waiting for the bus again and you answered the phone. I was hoping you would. I hope you're happy that I rang this phone again. Are you Susie? Susie said. Well yes, I kind of enjoyed speaking to you last night. The man said. Well that is splendid. Our feelings are mutual then. Tell me Susie, is there anyone else waiting for the bus? Are you alone? Susie said. Yes, I'm alone. This is a very quiet road you see. Not many people ever wait for this bus. The man said, Oh, it must be in the middle of the country then, Susie, since not many people catch the bus. Susie saw the bus coming up the road and said to the man, I'm sorry, the bus is here. The man said, How about we continue our conversation tomorrow night? Same time, Susie? Susie agreed. The next night at the same time, the phone rang again. The man said, Susie, I'm not sure I even told you my name. My name is Fred Susie, and do you know I love your voice, but I would love to be able to put a face to that voice. How about we meet in person Susie, would you like that? Susie thought about it, then quickly said, well yes, if you would like that, sure. She gave him the directions to the phone boot, and told him she would meet him at 9.30 tomorrow night. Back at Susie's house, her dad was reading a newspaper article, 
about a serial killer at large in their locality and the surrounding areas of the countryside around their village. He was worried she was out late and was just about to call the police when she had walked in the door. Susie felt a strange feeling. It was like she was in love. She felt it strange knowing that she hadn't even met the man but still felt strangely in love with him. She told her sister about her meeting him tomorrow night. The next day when Susie asked to go out, her dad said, No way, you're not going anywhere tonight. Susie was mad until her sister had an idea that maybe he would allow both girls go to the cinema together. Rachel was going to the cinema while Susie would meet the man. Rachel said to Susie, Look Susie, I was thinking about this. Maybe it's a bad idea. You were going to meet this man. I mean, he could be anyone. He could be a madman for all we know. Susie laughed it off and said she would meet him and was sure he would be a really sweet guy. When Susie was on the bus, she heard a conversation between two people who were talking about a serial killer at large, a man who was targeting young women. Susie felt sick thinking of the stranger she was about to meet. She stayed on the bus and knew she couldn't go home, so she would go back to the cinema and join Rachel. But Rachel was worried about her sister and had already gone to meet her by the phone box. When Rachel was outside the phone box, she had been calling her sister's name, but all she could hear was her own echo. Suddenly a man walked out from the ditch and said, Hello Susie, it is so great to finally meet you. Rachel froze as the man went near her and she kicked him. The man said, Oh now, that's very nasty out of you Susie, very nasty indeed, and I have to punish you for that. He dragged her into his car and put her in the boot and shut it. Michael was searching for a place to stay in New York as he was offered a new job in Brooklyn. He was feeling disheartened as the more places he searched, the more he felt he couldn't afford anywhere as there was no place that met his budget. But suddenly, when he was just about to give up, something caught his eye. He had to read it twice to make sure he wasn't imagining it. There was an apartment in a building in Brooklyn, just a few blocks from where he was starting his job. He couldn't believe his luck, so he emailed the company right away, and a week later he moved in and was lying down on his bed smiling at the fact he had a place of his own in Brooklyn and was about to start a new job. He began to read a book and relax as he was starting work in a week. He was feeling tired and was about to go to sleep so he laid the book down beside him on the bed. Then he suddenly got a start when something like a shadow moved on the wall in front of him. He looked around expecting to see someone that made the shadow. But no one was there. No one was in the room. The shadows began moving around the room. He couldn't make any sense of them. Michael found it very hard to go to sleep that night, but eventually he slipped into a deep sleep. The next night the same thing happened. The next day he was walking down the street and past the street basketball court. He knew that the guys playing were looking at him strangely, so he asked could he help them. One guy said to Michael, 
you're that guy who moved into room 456 in the building, right up the block, right? Michael was surprised these strangers knew, and replied, Yes, how do you know that, and why do you ask? The boy said, Man, did you hear anything about that place? There's weird stuff happens there, that's all I'm saying. Michael was thinking about the boy's words, and instead of carrying on for his walk around the blocks like he usually did since he arrived in Brooklyn, he walked right back to his apartment. He opened his laptop and searched his address. He froze in horror when he saw a photo of a little boy and a man and woman on the screen. He guessed they were his parents. As he read on, he learned that the little boy was out playing one day when a Necronomicon book from H.P. Lovecraft was thrown out the window from stories above and hit the boy on the head. The boy suffered memory loss and trauma and was put into foster care and his parents were found in the apartment with their bodies mutilated. There was no evidence of anyone in the apartment and no conclusion as to what really happened the boy's parents. Michael heard of H.P. Lovecraft before and knew about his famous monster Kalulu. Then suddenly shivers ran up his spine as he thought of the shadows going up and down the wall many times since he arrived in the apartment. They reminded him of what Kalulu looks like that he saw down through the years. He remembered when he was a kid reading comics and the character was in loads of the pages in different forms of horror. Then suddenly Michael heard a noise and he screamed when he saw a weird looking monster in front of him which even though he couldn't believe his eyes knew that it had to be Kalulu. He screamed as the monster rushed for him and as he backed back more and more Michael fell through the glass out the window and fell on the ground and was killed instantly. As he was falling to his death his memory came back it was always Kalulu who was making sure of Michael's fate. Michael got his job in Brooklyn and found the apartment and was drawn here by the spirit of Kalulu who hadn't finished him years ago. The curse only had power in the apartment. Just before he hit the ground he had remembered he was that little boy in the photograph. So many years ago that got knocked unconscious by the Necronomicon being thrown from his apartment. Now the job is done, and now Michael is gone.